very much. Um, I have to confess, particularly after what Gareth has just been talking about, I feel slightly fraudulent in standing here because I'm not, I'm not any sort of expert in visualisation at all. Um, but I think that, that certainly those of you, I think, who, who know me of old will know that I, one of the things I'm interested in is essentially lifting the lid on all sorts of different practices involving uh, digital techniques within archaeology and just peering beneath the surface uh, and maybe asking a few questions. Uh, and I guess that's really what I want to, uh, to do in this session here. Because what I want to try and do here is to consider, begin to consider our relationship with the, the digital technologies uh, that we use, the visualizations in particular that we produce with them, and, and question some of the perceptions that we have uh, about them and the implications they have for our practice. I think one of the problems that we frequently uh, encounter with this sort of process uh, is the hyperbole that's typically associated uh, with technologies. For instance, we're told, and I didn't realise until today how appropriate this slide was, uh, we're told that smartphones are becoming extensions uh, of our senses. Uh, the devices that we have in our pockets are already capable of exceeding human resolution uh, in terms of visual and oral acuity. And the future is apparently anticipated to bring sensors that go beyond uh, vision and hearing and transmit movement, smells and textures. And furthermore, we're told that the, uh, the enha enhancing our virtual senses is going to increase our knowledge, particularly when we move into a virtual world uh, with, in which we're interconnected uh, with everybody else. So from a technological perspective, at least, the future looks bright for visualisation. But what if we step aside from that sort of techno-boosterish approach uh, and approach visualisation from a rather different, albeit still technological, perspective? I think one of the things that we, we, we generally do is to conceive of our consumption uh, of visualisation as archaeologists in being, in various senses, scientific all too often. Uh, that they're seen as being in some ways neutral, objective, distance, passive, these are sort of the sorts of terms that we often encounter when we're looking at visualizations. And of course, that's not to suggest for one minute that that's how our audience perceives uh, these, these sorts of visualizations. And indeed, that might lie behind uh, some of the unanticipated consequences uh, that our, our visualizations actually have. This is a recent example uh, from, from home where it was really quite interesting to see that once the media got hold uh, of the, the facial reconstructions, this, this became not just a possible reconstruction of the face of Robert the Bruce, but it became the face of Robert the Bruce. Uh, and similarly on the right was the reconstruction of Robert the Bruce's tomb, which again became his tomb, in spite of the fact that it only exists in the, in the shape of about a dozen fragments that size spread across a half a dozen, dozen different museums. So the visualizations escape, they have a, a life of their own uh, and perhaps move beyond the original intentions uh, of the creators. So the act of viewing is generally far more uh, active and engaged than we sometimes give it credit for. And I'm not going to go into this any further because people like Stuart Jeffrey, uh, Colleen Morgan, uh, Alice Watterson and others have discussed the consumption uh, of images, so I'm not going to develop that here. But generally speaking, we recognise, even if our audiences don't necessarily recognise, that these digital visualisations are interpretative in nature. Uh, although how or indeed whether we incorporate this within our visualisations is still, I think, a matter of debate. But we understand that the data we base our visualisations upon are all too often incomplete, uh, that they are often ambiguous, equivocal, contradictory, and potentially misleading, whether, whether or not we choose to represent that explicitly within the visualisation. And again, there's all sorts of arguments about uh, authority and authenticity here, uh, which I won't go into. But I think one of the things that receives rather less uh, attention is the relationship we have with the digital tools that we use to create these sorts of visualisations. And that's what I'm particularly interested in here. In particular, what I want to, focus, to suggest is that the roles of the digital devices that we use are under-recognised and under-theorised. 
the visualization as an end product is quite inevitably and quite naturally foregrounded. And the extent to which the digital contributes to that visualization is often rather left to one side. So I suppose in essence, what I'm saying in a long-winded fashion is that I want to examine the agency of the digital in understanding their effects on uh, visualization. Now, of course, introducing agency into the conversation immediately presents a series of bear traps, which I hope to uh, dance delicately around. Although, having said that, I'm going to potentially compound the problem by introducing, uh, by linking agency with distributed or extended cognition, so as to try and outline the role that they have in what I'm notionally calling extended practice. <coughs> so. What happens between the visual concept that we have in our minds and its digital, digital visualization? Well, in principle, I think we're increasingly offloading our visualization tasks onto the computer. And in the process, the computer is making the process simpler and more accessible. And it consequently enables us to create much more elaborate, much more flexible, more interactive, more realistic visualizations than we would otherwise be able to do. And the creation of the digital tools that are involved in this process uh, in, in, entail what Edmondson and Beale said a few years ago. They characterise this as building thought into things, thereby reducing what were originally very complex tasks into relatively simple activities. Consequently, our cognitive conceptions are mediated and enabled by the technology and the increasing computer power and the associated computer software combine together to support this process of cognition uh, and arguably add to it in the process. Uh, and we only need to consider uh, the uh, transformation of digital visualization tools over the past 30 years to see this process in action and the way in which the digital devices have taken over increasingly major aspects of the creative process hiding them behind uh, interfaces which disguise and at the same time often beguile us. So in this way, cognition and practice are extended beyond ourselves and into the devices uh, that we are using. Now we could see this as a very sort of straightforward, equal, symmetrical relationship, a variant of Clark's parity principle, for example. Or we could see it as an asymmetric relationship uh, with ourselves as the primary agent in this process, akin to Sutton's complementarity principle. And I think I would probably argue for complementarity rather than parity in this process, seeing the actions of these digital devices as complementing rather than acting as equivalent to human cognition in the creative process. Although with devices increasingly capable of arguably intelligent intervention, that balance might be shifting. <coughs> So how does this complementary relationship affect our visualizations? I suppose key in this is the recognition that, that while the cognitive digital device does not conceive of the visualization itself, or at least not yet, it responds to human intentions. It, it nevertheless significantly influences that, that visualization through the various range of con <coughs> constraints that it imposes. These are incorporated intentionally or unintentionally by the software programmers and designers and so on. So this really, I think, to my mind, underlines that we're not dealing with a relationship of equals. The device doesn't conceive of the visualization on the one hand, but on the other hand, we don't have any control uh, over those constraints, short of perhaps installing or using a different software package, for example. And the kinds of constraints are uh, wide-ranging, they include the requirements for the input of data, they include the nature of the processing tools available, and again, we can consider uh, the contrast between, for example, three-dimensional models that were available to us uh, in the uh, 1980s with those that are available to us today, and the kinds of presentations that these tools uh, actually facilitate. Now, these are relatively obvious, I, I don't pretend any novelty here. Uh, and they, but they nevertheless directly affect the creation of the visualization. But I think there's also perceptual constraints that may be imposed by the broader environment that we're working in, digital environment that we're working in, which we frequently overlook. Just to throw one possible example um, out there. For instance, cognitive researchers 
uh, are increasingly demonstrating that the different groups or communities have different spatial frames of reference. And it's important because the way that we perceive the world is very much grounded in and constrained by our physical bodies and our experiences in that same world. So we're accustomed today, for example, to experiencing space in terms of front and back, left and right, uh, above, below, and so on. And we obviously use metaphors uh, that uh, in, you know, the, the future is forward, for example, the past is behind us, uh, and so on. And indeed, the very physical nature uh, of that has been demonstrated by a couple of cognitive scientists, uh, like Miles, for example, who showed that when people are thinking about events in the future, they actually lean forward ever so slightly. And when they're thinking about events in the past, they tend to lean backwards. We're talking about tiny millimetres of movement here, so it's very small, but nevertheless, it is apparently significant. And it tends to underline the relationship between the body and the cognitive representation. However, evidence is beginning to suggest that the, the sort of egocentric uh, perceptual model that we rely on uh, is actually not a natural uh, model, it's learned. Uh, we, learn, we pick this up during childhood. Um, and other people involve a more alternative model, a more geocentric model, for example, for instance, based on different sides in the world, uh, left and right and forwards and backwards, perhaps based upon the cardinal points derived from uh, the rising and setting of the sun, for example, or uh, alternatively their physical experience in the world. Uh, their forwards and backwards perhaps becomes uphill and downhill, uh, for example, even when no gradients uh, are actually involved. <coughs> so what is the effect of spatial frames of reference on our visualizations, especially since our devices specifically encapsulate one particular uh, frame of reference? And so I suppose what I would suggest is we might expect that mapping between these different models uh, in the virtual worlds that we create might not, at the very least, might not be straightforward. What is the effect of modelling uh, an environment in one frame of reference which would have been perceived uh, in a different frame of reference altogether? So, to conclude, I, I've tried to use the, the idea of uh, extended practice as a means of considering the relationship that we have between ourselves uh, and our digital visualisations. And I think extended practice provides a vehicle for connecting the physical and the virtual through highlighting uh, the interdependencies between ourselves as creators uh, perhaps I should write myself out of that particular group uh, but our, ourselves as creators and the tools that we are using uh, to assist us in, to create these visualizations we're building these visualizations from our thoughts from our conceptions interpretations uh, and yes from our biases uh, and so on our prior experiences come into this uh, and, and we do this through devices which themselves incorporate many of these same biases, expectations uh, and uh, preconceptions. But the cognitive agency of these devices is frequently derived from other people uh, who are distanced and removed from us. But nevertheless, they're supporting us in our creative practice. They engage with us in it, they influence it and they determine the eventual presentation of the resulting presentation, visualizations through the digital tools uh, that we're using. And I think that probably makes it more all the more important uh, that we recognize uh, our cognitive connections with the digital agents which support <laughs> and extend our practice. Thank you very much.